to discuss the issues surrounding the marginal oil field bid round is an oil and gas consultant and the founder of Septon Frost, Olayemi Ayanichi. Good morning and thank you for joining us on the program. Of course, I'm sure that you've watched that extensive interview with the DPR boss. You have advised on some of the largest and uh, the most significant oil and gas and energy bid rounds. What comes to mind listening to the DPR boss explanation about the processes for the 57 marginal oil fields? Um, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, having listened to the DPR director, um, I would just talk basically from the perspective of law and from the perspective of um, experience. Now, um, the marginal field award is actually the purview of the president of the country. So if you look at the petroleum map, it says the president has the right to approve. And it also says that the president may decline to grant a marginal field to anybody who does not meet the criteria. So um, there, there's a particular, uh, there's a subjective test. Is this person, I mean, acceptable to the federal government? And the way that law is worded, actually, uh, the president did not give you any reason why it's not acceptable. Uh, the president did not justify his decision. So whether that is the right kind of law for the environment we live in today is another matter entirely. It has that discretion. Imagine not feel that largely discretionary award, even when they are put to be, just because the president did not give a reason. Now, when you look at the guidelines, right, the guidelines state the criteria for award, the criteria, how the process will run. And um, like the DPR uh, director said, there is really nothing in the guidelines that compels them to make a public announcement. The guideline simply says that they would communicate with a successful bidder and let the successful bidder know that it has won. Now, um, from the perspective of being a Nigerian, my views may vary. I may talk about transparency. But if I were to talk as a lawyer, I would then say, you know what, when the government issues an express, a request for you to express your interest, they effectively say, you know what, they invite you, there is an invitation. And when you accept that invitation and you make an offer, they would, they, I mean, they are, they are entitled to act in accordance with the terms of the offer they have made to you. So uh, in that score, in the DPR uh, director right, I would say based on the guideline, and there was nothing in the guidelines that compelled them to either give a reason or to notify the public, as long as they notified people that are successful every step of the way, they have effectively complied with the terms of the guidelines. So how would you weigh the level of transparency adopted in the entire process, looking at the possibility of favoring uh, some certain companies? Well, well, you know, like I said, um, you know, transparency when you come to marginal field award, I, I think that's something we'll keep pushing. And not fully when the PIB is passed, things will improve. But as I said, it's purely discretionary. The law just gives the president the right. And it says that, you know what, they may not grant that approval to anyone that does not, they do not find suitable. So how do you justify transparency in a law that gives you carte blanche, uh, more or less? says you can just decide that this person is not suitable. The law does not compel you to give a reason. And to the extent that you are not required to give a reason, transparency itself is, um, is, really, is really an ideal that we're striving to achieve. So there's nothing that requires transparency. They may decide to be transparent based on where the world is going, but from a legal perspective, it's purely discretionary, actually. Now, part of what the DPR boss also talked about was the, that the uh, eventual winners of the bid round will be given two years prospecting license. What's the likelihood of a return on investment? Of course, when you look at the fact that uh, these oil fields have been abandoned for more than 10 years. Well, I, I'm not sure that's what, I mean, my, my understanding of what he said was that the fields must start producing. Uh, they do not read the end of life, right? And if you look at the guidelines, the guidelines actually gives them 60 months, that's five years, to show that they have done, I mean, that they have, um, they have worked that block, right, uh, diligently. Now, historically, when you look at what happened in 2003, a lot of fields were awarded, quite a lot of them haven't been developed. And I would think if the objective of the government is to increase participation of the indigenous uh, participants, if the objective is also increase the tax and all the revenues that come to government, the government has an incentive to make sure that these blocks are worked and they are produced in a judicious manner. So I, I, I do not believe that they say if you do not, I mean, that you must, 
that the, the thing comes to an end after two years. That's not my understanding of the guidelines. They have five years, but you must start producing in two years. And then if you actually do it, uh, you can you can work that field uh, diligently. The guidelines also say that you'll be given another term in line with the law. So you actually have two, more than two years for a, a, a field that is actually producing and working. But when you look at the number of bids submitted now, is there any likelihood of mergers between prospective companies? Um, well, the guidelines also allows that. So uh, people are allowed to be together and uh, people may be merged. Now, um, how that would work in practice, we would have to find out because I remember very well in 2005 where they had the local content vehicles and they were kind of imposed on um, uh, winners of blocks. It didn't work out very well because it's really difficult to put that much money into a project where you don't even know, uh, you don't understand your, your partners. So I, I reckon because of the, no the sheer number of applications and the sheer number of people that participated. And as you heard the director, a lot of Nigerians, a lot of Nigerians company now, love, uh, they have the competence actually to develop those fields without necessarily bringing in um, the um, um, foreign partners. And, you know, if you want to assure some kind of uh, equity amongst people, and you want to assure, you want to ensure that, you know what, well, there's, a, there's a balance of, of award, you may have to merge. It then depends on whether people that are merged decide to go with it. Like you said, some people would decline. I mean, I know a couple of people that would rather not really, if they don't like the, the, the identity of the people they've merged with, so ultimately, it will depend on who they've been matched with. It will depend on their risk appetite. It will depend on what they choose, they choose to do. And until that farm out agreement is signed, you can't really say that the process has been completed. All right, we'd like to thank you, Oil and Gas Consultant and founder of Stephen Frost, Olayemi Ayanichi. Thank you for sharing some of your time with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.